Good afternoon. This is CIBE 633 Environmental Hydrology, and uh, today is um, November 23rd, 2021, and the subject today is um, um, sustainability of groundwater. And uh, we're going to review three papers today. The first one is, um, let me just, uh, can you guys see the the page is green with red or orange? Yeah, we can see that page. Okay, fine. So we're gonna today we're gonna review three works, three pieces of work. The first one is by Charles Thais, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the work of Thais. Thais is considered to be the father of American hydrogeology. He's a well-recognized person. We're going to read a couple of sentences or a couple of paragraphs in his seminal work. Uh, he wrote a paper, he called it Essential Factors for Controlling or Controlling the Response of an Aquifer to Development. And he published it in Civil Engineering. It, interesting to note that Charles Thies was a civil engineer by training, and he was one of the great contributors to the subject of hydrogeology. I should also mention that we are going to do um, another uh, contribution of mine, which was done around the year 2007 or eight. And then as a third item, we're gonna, I'm going to review our paper that I wrote in the year 2009, or I'm sorry, 2005, uh, under the sponsorship of uh, the people from Boulevard in the San Diego East County. Uh, I should mention to you that um, when I wrote my book in the year 1989, my hydrology book, I felt that it was necessary that I dedicate the first 10 chapters to, to hydrology, to the calculations that are typical of hydrology, such as the rational method, the unit hydrograph and routing. And then at the end, I felt that it was necessary for me to add a few subjects or a few topics that were not typically hydrology, but they were kind of related to the water issues and that needed to be as part of the book to complement the book so that people that uh, pick, pick, would pick up the book, they would not think that all these other secondary subjects were missing. So I wrote a chapter on, um, on groundwater. That was, I believe, 11, chapter 11. So I had to review the issues of groundwater. Now, I've taken classes in groundwater many, many years ago, but I did that. I reviewed the issues and I wrote that chapter on the subject of groundwater. Then I had uh, 12 was snow, 13 was modeling, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, as a matter of fact, I did the last chapter, I decided to do sediment. And typically in a hydrology book, there is no sediment because it's a hydrology book. But since I was a sediment expert at the time, I decided that I, it was, it was going to be easy for me to do it. So we did it. So those are the five chapters that complement the first 10 chapters of my book. And that's how I was able later on readily to do, to do these other two contributions that we're going to talk about today. But first, let's get to the important stuff. Thighs, the work of thighs. This is an interesting paper and I, uh, I urge you to look at it. Perhaps don't spend a whole lot of time on it. It's very detailed. I'm not gonna quiz you on it, but I am going to review and read for you the second or third paragraph of this book, which is, which is the meat, the meat right here. Conditions of equilibrium in an aquifer. Is the size correct or should I blow it up a little bit? Uh, size have... looks good. Is that okay? Let yeah, it looks good. Up. There it is, okay. Right. I'm gonna read this for you because I believe this, this paragraph here is one of the most important paragraphs that I have read in, in American hydrogeology. Okay, all groundwater of economic importance is in the process of movement through a porous rock stratum from, from a place of intake or recharge to a place of disposal. That recognizes that groundwater is always moving. It is it's in its nature to move from here to there, from upstream to downstream. There is 
hardly no such a thing as static groundwater because if it does become static it kind of has a way of rising to the to the surface and then it evaporates it evaporates or it becomes a lake there's a whole lot of feed feed of uh, feeding of groundwater it will become a lake uh, many lakes are formed just by water by the groundwater arising to the surface or rising up to the surface velocities of a few tens or a few hundreds of feet a year are probably those most commonly met within aquifers not affected by wells basically he's saying in here that if an aquifer is affected by wells the velocities will increase will increase this movement has been going on through a part of geologic time meaning a lot of time we know what geologic time means it is evident that on the average the rate of discharge from the aquifer during recent geologic time has been equal to the rate of input into it meaning it's in equilibrium it's in balance whatever comes in goes out and in the middle there's a whole lot of water in movement like a control volume in movement uh, he doesn't talk about the control volume. The control volume is one of the most difficult things to determine in, hydro in, in groundwater movement, by the way. We'll, we'll have to refer to that later on. It is evident that on the rate, that uh, the rate of discharge from the aquifer, uh, I, I repeated that, is equal to the rate of input. Comparatively small changes in the quantity of water with accompanying changes in water level may occur as the result of temporary imbalance, or they should say imbalance, imbalance between discharge by natural processes and recharge. But such fluctuations balance each other over a complete season or climatic cycle. He's saying that every once in a while they, they, there may be transient uh, situations, but they balance out in a complete season or climatic cycle. Uh, oftentimes the seasons are not enough, but you have the multi-annual or pluri-annual condition. Under natural conditions, therefore, previous to development or prior to development by wells, aquifers are in a state of approximate dynamic equilibrium by wells. What is that? How old are, how, for how long have, have we society been pumping from wells? And the answer is 120 years roughly around the turn of last century. Uh, the pumps that we use now were developed to the point where we could start using, where you could start using mechanical force, like usually fossil fuels, right, to pump. Uh, prior to that, there were wells, but there were wells where you couldn't extract a whole lot of water because it had to be done by uh, human labor. Uh, but that did not amount to a whole much. But starting in the year 1900, like I said, and I say that because we read the papers around 1910, 1920, where the uh, early hydrogeologists or civil engineers turned hydrogeologists were actually trying to calculate the stuff. Uh, this paper by Thais, it's, date, it's dated um, 1941. So you can see the progression of the history of how this thing developed. Early in the year 1900, 1910, there was a paper by Lee, I believe, 1915, that is considered to be the first, one of the early, very early papers on what to do with the groundwater, how to calculate it, how to exploit it. 1915, Lee, and we have ref we referenced that paper in our work. Discharge by wells is thus a new discharge superimposed upon a previously stable system. So it was a stable system and we went in and started pumping the water. And it must be balanced by an increase in the recharge of the aquifer in the control volume, or by a decrease in the old natural discharge, or by a loss of storage in the aquifer. In other words, what he's saying is fundamental. He says, if we could consider a control volume, which is a difficult thing to do, but we could, in one way or another, consider control volume. If we're going to extract some, some water, it's going to have to do from, it could be for any one of three places, from upstream increasing the recharge, because the gradient is increased, or downstream re water returning from going downstream, it has been pulled back. That is the, a loss of the discharge in the downstream portion of the, of the control volume, or by decreasing the water level. That means depletion. 
so that that is what he said and that is correct and he said it early in his paper what we're going to do is we are going to simplify and um, state the same things that he has said in his paper but we're going to do it in a slightly different way in the way we like to do professor Pons likes to do that uh, to um, to summarize and to um, make it easy to understand, okay? And this is not a paper. Uh, I didn't ask anybody to publish it. I published it myself on the web. And that's a good thing about the web. There's a lot of things that you could publish and uh, you're free to publish that. So I say, the facts about groundwater sustainability. And I think I already told you that in the year 1905, no, it was 1905, it was 2005, I was, uh, I was invited to give a lecture there was luck too, by the way. That's why I talk about luck all the time. I was invited to give a lecture in uh, Boulevard, and that lecture led to a job because the lady that was in charge out there uh, wanted to do this study, this particular study. She wanted to write up the facts about groundwater, not this one, the one that comes later, which is related to this. And then this subsequently, we did this based on the other study, which we're gonna cover later on. So I put the facts together. Fact number one, uh, let me go rather fast on this because otherwise we won't finish. And I do want to finish with another third paper. It's a long paper, by the way. All groundwater reservoirs are temporarily holding water. Movement is the, is, is the fact. It, it flows from a place of recharge to a place of discharge. This is a nice graph uh, put together by the geological survey, which shows what, what I'm saying here. Fact number two. A pristine groundwater reservoir is in steady state with inflows equals to outflows. And this is a graph which we put color, but it is a graph by Thais, by the way. In his paper, there's this graph, the paper that we just reviewed. Fact number three, all pumping comes from capture. The greater the intensity of pumping, the greater the capture. People in the developmental area don't like to talk about capture because capture has a connotation of violence out there. But uh, the point is that we're capturing the water and taking it somewhere else. So all around water comes from capture. The greater the intensity of pumping, the greater the capture. Four, capture comes from decreases in natural recharge or an increases in aquifer recharge. In other words, at the same time, we borrow water that was moving downstream and we borrow more water that was, move, that was coming from upstream. So increases in in aquifer recharge and decreases in aquifer natural discharge. So basically pumping groundwater means you're taking water that was moving downstream and we took it at the, poison, at the point of pumping. Example, dead riparian trees near Ash Creek and we're gonna talk about this next week, by the way, this, this particular case study, which I, I happen to, I have gotten the data for this, for this project in Utah in the year 2008. Capture depends on usage and is not related to size or hydrogeological characteristics of the aquifer. So we're saying in here something very important that uh, the capture is the capture and is not related to the size or hydrogeological characteristics of the aquifer. We can't really say there's so much water there. <laughs> this is a subject that the hydrogeologists have looked on for 50, 100 years. They're trying to figure out how much water is there. And the point that we're making here is you can't do that because the amount of water is infinite. If you start pumping, you'll pump the heck of the whole thing. You can cover the state of California, go into Nevada and so forth. And this has been demonstrated by the way, I'm not just saying this, it has been demonstrated by people in geological survey. If you start pumping and you pump enough, you will pump out uh you will continue to reduce the amount of uh, uh increase the amount of water that you're pumping and the neighborhood is going to be affected you're getting it from somewhere you're getting from the near neighborhood and then from the far neighborhood and then from some other place fact number six the traditional concept of safe yield which equates safe yield with natural recharge is flawed okay the situation is in the past at the beginning uh Geologists were, or hydrogeologists were trying to calculate what was the recharge, and they figured that they were going to count on the recharge. They were going to pump the recharge. But the point is that there is recharge, that's true, on the so-called control volume. But there's also discharge. 
and the discharge happened to be equal to the recharge. So the net recharge is zero. Basically, it does say that if you don't want to touch anybody's property or anybody's uh, other third parties, you shouldn't be pumping. That's what it does say. It's hard, but it is true. Fact number seven, sustainable yield depends on the amount of capture and whether this amount can be socially accepted as a reasonable compromise within a policy of no use and the use of all natural recharge. This kind of talk or, or saying was brought out by, uh, by William, Bill Alley, William Alley. William Alley was a hydrogeologist. He was actually the head hydrogeologist of, of GS. GS is a lot of uh, geological survey. The geological survey has a lot of offices throughout the United States. And Ali uh, was ha happened to be residing here in town. I knew Bill for from he was a hydrologist, surface water hydrologist, and he turned hydrogeologist for whatever reason. And he wrote a couple of very good papers towards the turn of the century. And he was basically saying this: that um, capture is a compromise. It's a reasonable compromise. It's a socially accepted. It should be a socially accepted reasonable compromise because you're gonna be pumping a certain amount and around, people around you have to agree that you can pump that amount. And that, that leads, of course, to groundwater regulation. And Cassidy is going to give us a, a presentation in a couple of weeks on this subject, a, 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 a subject that we already know has been tackled or has been tackled by the state of California among the, one of the first states in the United States and they give themselves 30 years to solve the problem because it's a difficult problem. Nothing was done for the last 100 years. And all of a sudden, trying to do something will take a lot of effort. Sustainable yield is a moving target to be determined after judicious study and appraisal of all issues regarding groundwater utilization. This uh, statement is based on work that was done on the East Coast by people that have really done extensive work in this area. We have covered the work done by Sophocles, uh, Professor Sophocles, actually he was not a professor, he was with the GS2. GS2. Uh, there's a couple of other people, I don't remember the names right now, that did extensive work in the late 1900s, so about 20, 25 years ago. And we've co quoted all those papers. There's the issue of the High Plains Aquifer, which now is used is very much used as a case study of what to do and what not to do in groundwater utilization. We will get there eventually. Uh, maybe you may guys may not have heard of the of the High Plains Aquifer. That's an aquifer that covers about five or six states in the central midwestern United States, midwestern to this side, Oklahoma, north of Texas, Nebraska. That's where the High Plains Aquifer is. And I guess this is um, a graph that was put together by Bill Alley on what has happened out there. It's a big area, and over here, as you can see, the plane, the, the, the water table has been depleted. There's a whole lot of pumps out there. I've been doing this for maybe 50, 60, 80 years, and they have depleted the groundwater. They are actually depleting the groundwater. So then the issue is when are they gonna stop, if they're gonna stop at all, or else they're gonna deplete everything. And there's regulation, people there already know that, that they're gonna have to stop eventually if they're depleting the groundwater. And this is, by the way, this thing does not, just not happen only in the High Plains Aquifer, it happens everywhere in the world, not just in the US. Okay? Everywhere in the world people are depleting well, not everywhere, but I mean, most places, they are depleting the aquifer. Okay, fact number nine, sustainable yield may be expressed as a percentage of natural recharge. This is something we came up with. There's no relation between them, but if you're gonna do it, do it, but evaluate it as a percentage of natural recharge. So there's so much recharge, you can say 10%, 15%, that's what, we're, what, I, what I'm gonna pump, even though there's a, no physical relation between them because there is also natural discharge and that's not being accounted for. I didn't say sustainable yield is a percentage of the net recharge because otherwise it will be zero. The net recharge is zero, but we use natural recharge as a reference in order to get a, get a, at a number somehow. Fact number 10, 
interdisciplinary studies are needed to develop more experience in yield to recharge percentages. Why? Because, because we have situations like this tree that I have shown you before. This is a tree which I think it's the, it's the, uh, the largest by trunk size, trunk size, the largest in California. There was one about this large up in LA and it, it, it died, it fell through maybe 20, 30 years ago. You can look it up. It's the same uh, Coast Live Oak. Uh, this, uh, this I believe is the surviving, the last surviving, not the last surviving, but as far as large specimens of Coast Live Oak. And it happens to be in the middle of a desert. Boulevard is a desert, it's semi-arid, like 300, 400, um, actually not, not that even. It's about, it's less, a little bit less. It's about, I would say, millimeters or inches, 10, 11, 15 inches. So it's a desert, semi-arid, even arid, okay? Because semi-arid is from 400 to 800. We're talking here about maybe 250 to 300 millimeters, okay? 15 uh, inches. So why is this tree over here? We know for a fact that you have a, when you have a lot of uh, water, you, have a, you can have a thick or else a tall tree. And this tree is not that tall, but it's thick. This is the thickest tree I've ever seen. And we measured it to be, uh, uh, in meters, we measured it seven and a half uh, meters circumference because it's kind of ovoid. The cross section is ovoid, so you cannot express it as a radius. But the point is that, um, why, what is this tree doing there? And the answer is, happens to be at a spring right next. Right next to it, there's a spring. There's a lake, actually. Uh, McLean or McCain? McCain, McCain. There's a spring, there's a lake out there. So it just so happens they're lucky. The situation, there's a forest out there actually. A forest in the middle of the desert, yes, because the forest is being fed water from the nearby, from a nearby mountain where water collects. Fact 11, sustainability may be fostered by enlightened management seeking to capture re rejected recharge. Yes. So there's a lot of management that is being done nowadays everywhere, particularly here in California. We want to we wanna be able to say and do uh, conservation of the aquifer because we rely so much on the aquifer. I think I gave you the figure that 45% of the water we use here in California is groundwater. And I said at the time that I thought it was a high number that I, I will, I personally will feel more comfortable with a value of 20%. But the fact of the matter is, is that it is 45. Other states like Arizona, the percentage is even higher in Arizona. I'm not sure how much it is, but it should be on the 80 or 90% that they're getting their water from the groundwater. I'm not quite sure on that figure though, so don't quote me on it. But Enlightened, enlightened management seeking to capture rejected recharge. So if there's recharge that is rejected, you can capture and put it back into the aquifer. Encourage clean artificial recharge. Yes, that's being done, by the way, in several projects throughout California. And first, and C, limit negative artificial recharge. What is this negative artificial recharge? If you, if you uh, cover with concrete, that's negative artificial recharge. So we have to limit limit the development of the basins to with concrete. As a matter of fact, over the last 10 to 20 years, the issue or rather the topic of a permeable concrete has surfaced. You guys may not have heard of it, but it is ongoing now. We're trying to design ways of have, making concrete, not all concrete necessarily uh, low permeability as it is right now. Uh, like it make it a little bit like a soil that will take some permeability, will take up some water. That will so help solve problems with floods because the problem with flood is that we hurry to drain the water from the premises and, and the premises were saved from a flood. But we do not realize, typically we do not realize that all we do is contributing, contributing to the flooding of the next other neighbor because many people doing that will create flooding downstream. Fact 12, base load conservation may be regarded as a standard against which to measure groundwater sustainability. I do believe that this should be the procedure. Anytime there's a groundwater project, people in charge at the state level should go in there and, in there and say, you know, we have a baseline on the base flow here on the rivers that are around. 
don't mess with our base flow. You can pump all you want, but the minute you start decreasing our base flow, you're dead. You can't do it anymore because it's our base flow, not yours. And, and by the way, this kind of practice, you think that hasn't been done. Yes, it has been done in some places in the Eastern United States. There's papers that have been written for the last 15 years on this subject of base flow conservation, which I endorse. I espouse and I endorse that kind of approach. It is the base flow conservation that should be used as a ruler to control or regulate groundwater. But interestingly, we need a baseline. We cannot just go in there and say, oh, well, the base flow, if you don't know what the base flow was, right? So you must have a history. So it is important for society in general throughout the world to start measuring the base flow. Whatever it is, start measuring the base flow because eventually somebody's going to come out and say, I want to pump. And you'll say, okay, here's the base flow for the last five, 10 years. And the frequency, you know, the frequency of base flow, meaning how often does it repeat itself and so forth. There's some statistics in, engaged or involved in that in there and they would have to follow it. That is why. Let me say that the issue of the regulation in groundwater has not progressed too much. It is progressing now, but it hasn't in the past, in the last 20, 30 years. It is now. Why? Because there has been lack of knowledge. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. Some of it, some of it, if I may say, is a willing lack of knowledge. They don't want to, they don't want to uh, uh, uncover the the skeletons in the closet because it's tough. If you're irrigating somewhere in, in the Western United States and you're irrigating with groundwater, you don't want people to tell you that you're doing it wrong or you're doing it damage and so forth. You just don't want it. That's just the way it is. I, I'm telling you the facts, okay? 13, sustainability. This is the last one. Sustainability reflects resource conservation policy. The more conservative a policy, the more sustainable, right? If we decide overall a certain society or California, when say California has its own rules and laws, California can become more conservative in terms of the use of groundwater than other states. In the United States, it's like that. Every state can do its or their own thing. That's why they're states. That's why from the beginning, the states were different and they were put together and called United States, right? You guys know that, I don't need to tell you. So we end this, the, the discussion of this presentation, and now I'm gonna go to the big one. And I should tell you at this time, that I, at the time I wrote two papers, the 2006 called Groundwater Utilization, and the 2007 Sustainable, Sustainable Yield of Groundwater. Today I hope to do Groundwater Utilization because it is a long paper. And then next week I will start with uh, IO4 Sustainable Yield. What's the difference between these two papers? The first one is basic. It, it, and the second one is applied. So if you're talking about ease of reader, reading, the first one is easy. So it's gonna be a lot better for you to understand as a beginning reader of groundwater issues. That's the, the groundwater utilization, the paper we're gonna to read today is gonna to be easier to read. Next week on Tuesday, we're going to do this, this, this other paper, Sustainable Yield, and that's going to be tough. And I urge you to actually over the weekend, if you have some time, I know nobody has time nowadays, and we are entering into a holiday anyway, and we're all in a holiday mood. But if you have some time, take a look at next paper, because we're going to cover it next week, and it's going to be fast. We're going to cover it in a half an hour. Yeah, half an hour. We have other things to talk about. It's going to be difficult. But let me just go in there with any further ado and talk about this groundwater paper. I put this paper at the request of Donna Tisdale from uh, Boulevard. And Donna said, uh, Professor Pons, we have a problem. We try to explain groundwater to the politicians and <laughs> we don't know how to start. So I said, well, I'll write something, I'll write something on it. And I will try to make it so that it's readable. Uh, laypersons level of course we can't you can't get to a ninth grade level like you would in the case of for instance national geographic national geographic is a very successful magazine or has been in the past anyway because they write at nine grade level nine grade level they don't get difficult well other magazines out there get have gotten difficult and people don't read them anymore i don't want to mention names 
But let me just go back in here and let's not sidetrack in here. Okay, the indiscriminate and sometimes excessive use of groundwater has led to questions regarding its sustainability. It is everywhere. Everywhere in the world, people are talking about groundwater sustainability. It's a subject. Now, you think that this is geologic subject, but it is not, or hydrogeologic subject, but it is not. It is not a hydrogeologic subject because the hydrogeologists, if I may say so, were, were uh, they learned in school how to pump. So they're not going to take an issue or somebody that comes and says, you know what, you can't pump. Because if they don't pump, they're shooting themselves on the foot. So they're not going to do it. So this is a broader issue beyond or much beyond, much greater than hydrogeology. As a matter of fact, it encompasses hydrology. It is in, 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 effect, in effect environmental hydrology. It is within the scope of, uh, of the subjects that we're treating here in this course. Because when you start pumping in excess, you affect the base flow. The, once you affect the base flow, you affect the stream. Once you affect the stream, you affect this biota, and then you cut into sediment and so on and so forth. So it is the effects of groundwater overuse or overexploitation are very broad. And the hydrogeologists do not understand them because they were not trained to handle these issues. And I say that truly believing that that is the case. Okay, the sustainability of groundwater must be assessed from an interdisciplinary perspective where hydrology, ecology, geomorphology, and climatology play an important role. All these are subjects that you heard me talk about because we cover nicely or very well, I guess you could say, the interdisciplinary issues. But most people out there are disciplinary. They get into one field and they don't get out. You can't talk to them in terms that they cannot or will not understand. So shallow groundwater flow systems should be distinguished from deep groundwater flow. The former interact with surface water while the latter do not. So there's a lot of complexity in it, complexities in here. Excessive pumping can lead to groundwater depletion. Yes, we know that. That is a fact. Unregulated groundwater use leads to the tragedy of the commons. Now, you may or may not have heard this issue about the tragedy of the commons. It was developed in the year 1968 by uh, a man by the name of Harding. I believe it's Harding. He's a British gentleman. He wrote a paper. He was an economist. And he wrote a paper, uh, he called it The Tragedy of the Commons, which uh, we'll get into there. So I'm into that. We'll get into that subject. I believe there's one of the, one of the yeah, it's one of the subjects. So I'll, I'll get into the, that. If, if you haven't heard that subject, it is a very important subject. It's an environmental subject. It's very important. Everybody should understand the basic concept of the tragedy of the commons. As a matter of fact, it, it, it is given a proper name. It's called Harding's Tragedy of the Commons, 1968. Okay, to assure sustainability, studies must, must, studies must show that the hydrological, ecological, and other impacts of groundwater utilization are minimal. Sustainability also implies water quality, because water quality goes in hand with water quantity. Okay, so now let's take a look at water and groundwater. We have 17 or 16 sections in this paper. So I'm going to cover them. Some of them are very general, but important nevertheless. And others are very technical, hydraulic stuff. I'm not going to cover, dwell too much on the hydraulic stuff because I believe this is not a course in hydraulics. The course is, the course is on environmental issues of hydrology and groundwater. So that's where we, we are going to put the emphasis here tonight. Groundwater flows underground. Groundwater originates in precipitation. All groundwater originates in precipitation. Percolation is the flow of water through the soil. The water separates into the saturated or aquifer zone and the vato zone, which by the way, there's a mis misspelling in there. I reviewed this this morning and I missed that, so I'll fix it later. It says vasdos, but it, I, it's V-A-D-O-S-E where the waters does not fill the, the voids. That means that you have, you have in the soil, you have a vato zone, which is on the surface, where it's kind of unsaturated. 
and then by the time you reach the groundwater, it is saturated. The ground, the water fills out all the pores, all the pores in the soil. And you would remember that Meisner, who wrote a very important paper in the year 1927, 28, he said that he was commissioned by the Geological Survey to do a survey of groundwater because people in his, uh, in his outfit in the Geological Survey were given by the government the fact of figuring out where's the groundwater because the government established a Geological Survey to serve as the agency that provides the inventory of the water resources, water and mineral resources of the United States. So it, it was within the purview of the GS and Meisner to do that. However, Meisner got sidetracked, if I may say so, because he realized that the depth of the water level, the depth of the groundwater was related to the ecology, to the plants. So he really got sidetracked. He was not a biologist or ecologist. I believe Meisner was a civil engineer, but he was a civil engineer, had, civil engineer that had a broad view going beyond just water. Because as you know very well, we talked about it in this class extensively, water is there and it's important that we study water, but we cannot limit ourselves to studying only the quantity of water because then they will miss everything else. That's what we are here to correct. That's why we call this environmental hydrology. Environmental covers everything else that in the past, quantitative hydrology did not do. Believe me, when I went to school 50 years ago, they taught hydrology and it was all volumes. It wasn't even getting to, to discharges. It was just volumes, the volume of water here, the volume of water there. It was volume, it was like volume was water. Water was volume and volume was water. That's not true, that's not 100% correct. The focus is only on volume. Okay, to what extent can a region ground regions groundwater resources be exploited without unduly compromising the principles of sustainable development. What's this red phrase doing in the middle of a paper? Well, we developed this, 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 uh, I guess I could say this stuff for the purpose of uh, interesting the politicians, supposedly they were going to read this paper. Uh, they probably don't have a whole lot of, uh, how can I say, uh, can't concentrate a whole lot in one thing. <laughs> That's that's why they're politicians, right? And uh, and so therefore we were trying to force their views so that they can read the important stuff. So a lot of the important uh, concepts that we write in this paper are are underscored or put in this way so that people can be sure that they don't miss it. Because a long paper has a tendency to not to be read completely. We're we're reading it here because we are studying it. And I urge you to, after we do this, to review this paper again, two or three, at least a couple of times prior to the exam, because the subjects that are in here will be on the exam. Okay. Origin of groundwater, where does it come from? Precipitation that does not form part of surface runoff remains on the surface, percolates into the ground. Once it gets into the ground, it can remain in the vital zone, now it's spelled correctly, subject to capillary action. Capillarity is uh, the, the, the force, the physical force in the vato zone, in the unsaturated zone. Return to the atmosphere via evaporation and evapotranspiration. Yes, once it gets into the ground, it can return to the atmosphere. It can be picked up by the roots and sent back to the atmosphere. Or if there's enough water, it'll flow down. You know, the, the plants will take whatever they're gonna take. And then the rest by gravity, it'll flow by gravity and it'll reach to the groundwater. Okay, it reaches the groundwater at which time it joins the groundwater proper. Interestingly though, the issue is, what is the direction of the unsaturated flow? And the answer is, technically it can go anywhere. It depends on luck, but in practice it goes down by gravity. Most of the times it goes down. That has been discussed in the literature, by the way. So we are to assume that the water, once it gets into the ground, it would primarily flow down, down, gravity, vertically, down, once it reaches the groundwater. And once it reaches the groundwater table, the groundwater table, groundwater table, it'll do a, a 90, 91, 92 degrees change into where the gradient is going, downstream. It'll move downstream. So it goes like coming down and then turns around like 91 degrees. 
I say 91 degrees because it cannot turn around 90 degrees because it will be then become immobile, it becomes static, there's no gradient. It has to have a small gradient, a very small gradient. The gradient of the groundwater usually follows the terrain gradient. So if the terrain gradient is 1%, the flow of the groundwater will also be 1% on that order. That has been documented, by the way. So through millennia, groundwater has accumulated underground. Okay. In the direction of the closest ocean. So technically, all the groundwater that seeps into the ground in the groundwater, it should get into the closest ocean. So there is the, uh, the what is called the Devorsham Aquarium. They're in the middle of the continent. Like in, in the United States, that is, uh, where is that? somewhere in Colorado or Utah. The water raining on the left side goes to California or actually it goes to the Colorado River. And if it's in Utah, it stays there. It doesn't move anywhere because it's in Dorre. But then it goes to the Columbia River, right? And the various rivers in California. But if, it, if it's on the right side, then it goes to the Mississippi. Uh, the South Platte and the North Platte River in uh, Nebraska. Eastern Colorado and Nebraska, to name only a few of them, they eventually get into the Mississippi. And uh, on the other side, the Appalachian Mountains, you know the geography already. West of the Appalachian, most of the Mississippi, east of the Appalachians, and the eastern United States. So, groundwater is divided into shallow groundwater flow and deep groundwater flow. Why? Because according to Shevot Tarev, we can talk about the uh, the ten kilometer range of uh, of uh, I remember I forget the name right now is the the zone or level the zone of activity of the groundwater where we could use it and why is it because it's fractured enough due to earthquake activity the ten kilometer below ten kilometer according to Shevotarev and others. The earth, the earth crust is not fractured enough, so it doesn't contain as much groundwater. Besides, 10 kilometers are really very deep. It would, it would take a tremendous amount of effort to pump below 10 kilometers. Most pumps right now are within one kilometer or one and a half, something on that order. They don't go that deep because water is heavy. So if you want to raise it for one kilometer, I mean, you got to apply a lot of force. And typically nowadays that forest is usually usually fossil by the way so so from a standpoint from an environmental standpoint it's not very good okay so um so now we're going to go into the ground and the water balance in here let me i'm controlling you here the what we're doing and on a global basis the annual amount of shallow percolation is equal to the annual amount of base flow that discharges into streams and rivers in other words is shallow percolation turns around and goes into the streams and rivers. Since base flow, base flow constitutes 40, 30% of stream flow, and stream flow is about 40% of precipitation, it follows that base flow or shallow, the shallow percolation that shows up as base flow is about 12%. So we have a water balance in here. And this is global, by the way. It does not apply specifically to any site. It's just global. 58% evaporation and evapotranspiration. Evaporation from the ground and evaporation from evapotranspiration from the plants. Direct runoff 28%, base flow 12%, and then there's a 2% deep percolation, which was calculated by the way the by the great book uh, World Water Balance that by that was done by the Russians in the year 1978. They figured that the deep percolation was on the order of zero to five percent, with an average of two to two and a half percent, say two percent. That's the water that basically goes too deep, we can't grab it because it's already, it's gotten too deep. And uh, so that's the one that we feel that, that we feel in this paper that we could ascribe because it's nobody's water. It goes too deep, once it goes too deep, it goes eventually, I mean, a hundred or two hundred, a long time later into the ocean, into the nearest ocean. If it's in Utah or somewhere out there in Colorado, it will take a long time for it to get to the coast. We don't know, that has not been calculated, but it will get there. We know that it'll get there. Why? Because it's following the gradients and there are gradients. There are gradients. So the amount of deep percolation is of considerable practical interest from the standpoint of sustainability. We figured, and I, I guess I can say I figured 
that that's the one that is anybody's, anybody could own the deep regulation because it's really nobody's. Interesting thing about it is that it is a hard thing to calculate. So we use the, the number 2% just because, because we got to grab a number, but it could be according to the studies between zero and 5%. And there's very few studies that have been made on the issue of what deep percolation is. If you Google deep percolation, you're gonna have a whole, you're gonna get a whole, uh, Google, Google, Google. You're gonna get a whole lot of papers on percolation and irrigation, which is technical, deep percolation and irrigation, which is not the same. It's not the same subject. Irrigation, deep percolation is not the same type of this geologic deep percolation. Quantity and quality. There's a lot more groundwater than surface water. We calculated it according to US Geological Survey studies that it's about 30%, 30%, no, not 30%, uh, 100 times. There's 100 times more groundwater than surface water. The difference is that groundwater has a tendency to be more saline. Why? Because it has to do with the contact. This is something that I thought for a long time, and I finally found it. Why is it that groundwater is more saline than surface water? Because of the time of contact with soil. The surface water has not had a whole lot of time of contact. In the groundwater, it's been there all the time, and so there's a lot of, a lot of uh, time and space, time and time and end or space. And when you have time or space, uh, of groundwater being con water being connected with the soil, it has a tendency to leach because that is what nature decided to do because water has, has a lot of pickup. We know that. We have studied this already. So the longer the groundwater sits there, the more salty it becomes. And these concepts were all confirmed by the study of 1953 study of Shevot Arep, by the way. I already talked about that. Um, he studied about 800, I believe it was 800 uh, data, 800 wells with data that had a lot of data throughout the world, as a matter of fact. He was, he was Russian, but he was working out of Australia. So anyway, so we know the groundwater is there, but we happen to know that it is saline. The deeper you go, the more saline. So it is not good for us to pump deep groundwater because if we pump, we're gonna have to deal with the salt. If we're far from the ocean, we got a tough problem. We could end up with something like the Southern Sea again. We don't want to make the mistakes that, we, that were done in the past, which we can now at this point fix, right? We know better than a hundred years ago when they did the Southern Sea, when they started the development of the Southern Sea. The age of the groundwater. Age is a major difference between surface water and groundwater. Surface water recycles every nine to 16 days that has been calculated, while the groundwater recycles every, on the average, 15, 1,500 years, on the average. It could be 100, it could be 1,000, it could be 10,000, it could be 30,000. But the calculation has been done about 1,500 years. Nobody's gonna sit down to wait for 1,500 years for it to recycle. So basically the groundwater, once it's used, it's gone. Once it's used, it's gone. They could say, well, the fastest that it'll recycle will be 100 years. But who's going to sit down to wait for 100 years? Nobody. So the groundwater should not really be depleted. Not only because it affects the, the surface water in the vicinity, because it has many other effects, mechanical and so forth, which are not related to just to hydrology. And we will cover that later on in this, in this paper. Okay. Surface groundwater does not recycle readily. Renewal rates of deep groundwater are about 1 15th, 1 15th of those of shallow groundwater. And I have a quote in here. Some fossil or paleo groundwaters may have ages exceeding 30,000 years. And the more, the, the older they are, the more saline they are. And there's people that are specialized in carbon dating, by the way. So we're not saying this out of the blues, this is the number. We're quoting stuff that has been referred to in the literature. There's a paper by Jones in there and many other papers. Okay, so recharge and discharge. So groundwater recharges on top of the hills or right next to it and discharges in the valleys. That's a fact too. In the valleys and then eventually uh, the surface water discharges in the valleys. The groundwater could recharge, discharge in the ocean already. But this is a very interesting graph 
It was put together by the Ministry of Environment in British Columbia that we liked and we put it all here. Okay, excessive pumping can lead to groundwater depletion wherein groundwater is extracted at a faster rate that it can be replenished. Has this happened? And the answer is it's happening as we speak. It is happening here in California. It is happening elsewhere. Uh, people are trying to do something about it, but we really, really, as a society in general, global society, haven't figured out a way to controlling the problem. Because we know that it would have economic impacts if we stop completely the pump, pumping of groundwater a lot of people will be out of business. A lot of people are without, without money and they're obviously are politically, uh, uh, how can I say, they have uh, influence enough to stop the situation. That is why California gave itself 30, 30 years and, and uh, Cassidy can illustrate us a little bit more as to the politics of how is it that, that we end up giving ourselves 30 years to regulate the groundwater use in California. I understand it's difficult, by the way. I don't, I'm not saying that I blame them for doing that. I'm just saying it is a difficult subject. It's full of political ins and outs issues. Physical properties, I'm going to kind of go over quickly the physical properties of hydraulic conductivity and specific yield. And then there's the Darcy's law, which everybody knows, Q equal A, K, I, where A is the area of flow, K is the hydraulic conductivity and I is the gradient. And the gradient is the, the pressure applied. And there's an example in here uh, developed in Wisconsin, in Portage County in Wisconsin, the experimental setup for Darcy's. I pulled this out of the web, of course. The web is good with this stuff. If you don't have it, you can persist or insist on the web. And eventually, if you're lucky, you'll get something that you can use. Because we didn't, we didn't, uh, there was a good, this is a good uh, graph show, showing the gradient showing what a gradient is, because I've talked about a gradient a lot. And of course, I understand all of your civil engineers and gradient is not a, not a, a new subject for you. Hydraulic gradient, right? We already know that. Without a gradient, the water wouldn't move. Aquifers, types of aquifers, unconfined and confined. This throws a little bit of complexity in there because the soils, the soils are anybody's guess. Uh, out there in the Central Valley, we have aquifers on top, then the, we have layers of clay, and then aquifers at the bottom, it's a mess in terms of what it is exactly. So we have to deal with that. We have to deal with this local situation because every situation is different. The, the Central Valley happens to be an old lake, an old, that has been documented by the way, just about everything has been documented. It happened to be, happens to be an old lake. And I don't know what name it had, but it was 600 million years ago. And at about that time, there was a change in weather that rained a lot and the lake burst at around the level where the outlet has now been created to exit to, for the lake to flow into the uh, vicinity of San Francisco, the city of San Francisco. So that's where we have the outlet the outlet of the Central Valley now. So basically what we can say is that, based on the studies that have been made, that the lake was there for a long time and 600 million years ago, 600 million, yes, 600 million years ago, it breached and it became a valley. And that's why the Central Valley is flat. It has the mountains on both sides. It has the Sierras on the right, on the, on the east and, and the coastal range on the left. So if you travel that way, and I'm sure you guys have, that's I I five, I believe, right? Right. Uh, so you go to San Francisco and, and you take the 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 road that everybody takes, you go to the Central Valley. It's thousands and thousands of acres of land out there, which have been dedicated over the last one hundred years to agriculture, to Larry Lake Basin, to Larry Basin is out there. Then we have the San Joaquin, and then we have the Sacramento. Why two different rivers? The San, jo San Joaquin is not the Sacramento. The San Joaquin is full of salt, and the Sacramento is free of salt. How is it that one could be salty and the other could not be salty? We've studied that. And it, it, if you look at it carefully, it makes sense. Because as you move north 
according to nature's laws, because the world is round, right? There's going to be more rain. There's going to be more rain. There's these issues about the, the circulation, atmospheric circulation. So rain increases as you move up north of San Francisco, rain starts increasing. And then you get all kinds of weather relation, or rather when rain increases, the, the soils get leached over time, geologic time. So you have less salt. So the Sacramento is basically a relatively clean river compared to the San Joaquin. And never mind the Tulare. The Tulare is full of salt. All the rivers in Tulare are full of salt. Not only full of salt, but also salt that is staying there and is not is not being moved at all for the last 100, 120 years. Okay, so we have a situation or an example in here of Georgia's coastal plains and how it works. It's a it's a good graph. As you can see in here, the ver vertical axis or vertical scale has been exaggerated. So for it to show, if they had to plot it in the, on true sc scale x y, you couldn't see it. You see, so it's vertical. The vertical ha scale has been exaggerated, and you can see the movement of what of groundwater downstream toward the nearest ocean. That's the way it always works. Dependent. They got to follow a gradient. If there's no gradient, then you're stuck, right? But typically there is a gradient. Now, there's places, for instance, like in Florida, the state of Florida hardly has a gradient at all. It's flat everywhere, right? So I'm not going to tell you about Florida because I really don't know, although I've done some studies in Florida, but they have been studies of surface water, not of groundwater. So I really don't know. I should not talk about the situation in Florida. But I can tell you, I've been there and I know it's extremely flat there must be hardly any gradients at all to move the stuff out, okay? Depending, depending on their age, aquifers are quaternary and tertiary. Quaternary have soils, usually sand and gravel. The more sand and gravel the aquifer has, the easier it can conduct the water and the better, the faster it can come out, and those are the real aquifers. If there's some sand and silt, we run into trouble. We can't do it. It doesn't come out. And they have examples. I'll show you later on examples of what I'm saying here. Uh, if there is no quaternary deposits, meaning sedimentary deposits of sand, salt, sand and soil, clay, gravel, there are many aquifers out there which are of tertiary origin or age, tertiary age. Those are rock aquifers. Can the rock aquifers have water? And the answer is yes. There's many rock aquifers out there. And I have a good example in here. I found on the web, I also borrowed from the government of South Australia this very good graph. The sedimentary aquifers in Australia, in the continent, and the fractured aquifers. You can see the color, this color in here, it's not in here. You know, there's a, some superposition in here, overlap, but clearly you got here along the coast rock and over here a whole lot, lot of rock, but in here you have sediment, you don't have rock, but you have sediment over here. So how is it that some places had rock and some places had sediment? That's the luck of the draw. I mean, you can't ask that question because it goes back 500, uh, 500 million years, like the, like the example I was giving you about about uh, Central Valley, okay? So you can't ask the question, it's just the luck of the draw. We, uh, here in San Diego, for instance, we have, we have a rock aquifers in East County. East County is all rock aquifers. And the rock aquifers are not alluvial aquifers. The alluvial aquifer fills and drains in about 10 to 15 years. If, it, if, they're, if they're small, if they're large, they don't. But the aquifers out there are small on uh, in east county boulevard east county if you guys don't know where boulevard is all you need to do is drive on i-10 about an hour from san diego going to to uh imperial valley el centro it's about two hours to el centro well once you reach one hour then you are in boulevard it's uh it's a uh, i believe boulevard is an incorporated area of san diego i'm not quite sure but Boulevard in Tierra del Sol, which I have studied extensively over the last 10, 15 years, is part, it's a community of, of Boulevard, right? Tierra del Sol is a community of Boulevard. And they actually, I think I mentioned this before, they abut with the border. 
So the southern limit of Tierra del Sol is the border with Mexico. Okay, we've studied that area, by the way, because we, you heard me talk about it. We studied the Tierra del Sol watershed extensively, by the way, over the years. So we have to know that area. Okay, groundwater systems. Groundwater flow system may consist of one or more aquifers of different types. So it becomes complex. Not only it becomes complex, it is on the ground. We can't really see it. This is not like a canal or a watershed, which we can look at it and make some conclusions as to physical, chemical, and so forth. And here it's on the ground. So since we can't see it, then we've got to rely on the, on the technologists or groundwater people that will use all kinds of different kinds of instruments to figure out what the properties are. And they can be done. But it, when you're talking about um, rock aquifers, it is chancy. If it's, if it's sedimentary aquifers, it's very well behaved because the flow is diffusive and there's a diffusion equation and you can model it. But if it's rock aquifer, the flow is not diffusive. The flow is convective, meaning it convex through the cracks. It does not flow through the matrix because it cannot flow through the matrix. It will be too slow to flow. Can you imagine a piece of rock and flowing through the rock? It will flow, but it's too slow for us to be of any utility, for us to be of any utility. It will be about the, the permeability of concrete or even less. And per, the permeability of concrete is currently 10 to the minus 16 centimeters per second, 10 to the minus 16. The thickest clay is 10 to the minus 12. And sand is 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3. So there's 10 orders of magnitude, permeability, variability, or range, permeability range, 10, 15 orders of magnitude. So you can run water through rock, but you can run it through the cracks. So the more cracks an aquifer has, the more water it can hold. And this is what happens in Tierra del Sol and Boulevard. But interestingly, though, if you if it rains a whole lot, it will fill quickly within a few hours or within a few hours. say two three days, the whole thing will fill up. And then if you pump a whole lot of it, which you could industrially, you could. Now, if you have only homes out there, you can't because people don't use a whole lot of water. But if it's an industrial use, they can pump the the ground the the aquifer dry. There there is the that's the fact. So then there's the issue of which usage is the one that we're going to apply in a certain case. So as you can see, the stuff is complicated because of the fact that it's below ground and it was it would uh, the properties would be difficult to ascertain. We've done work in this area, in the area of groundwater sustainability. I did not want to get into groundwater geology because I didn't think I, it was my job. My job was to study the groundwater sustainability issue and that covered taking a look at the surface water because the surface water gets affected when you pump too much groundwater. So they're together, okay? Uh, many years ago, I met a student of mine, former student of mine 40 years ago from Ecuador. And he said to me, Professor Pons, we're running out of ground, uh, we're running out of surface water. We've been looking at it 40 years and we just don't have any surface water left in the basin. So we think we're going to get into, he had by that time when he was with me, he was a student, junior person. And then 40 years later, he turned out to be the big boss out there at his agency. He says, we're going to get into the groundwater. And I said, so and so, be careful. If you hire a, a groundwater specialist, hire also a surface water specialist because, because they go hand in hand. You can't exploit groundwater by itself. Not anymore these days. You used to, but not anymore, because the groundwater specialist is going to just pump all the groundwater because that's what they know what and how to do. They're not going to look at the base flow. And I have a lot of stories to tell you about this, but I'm not going to. It will divert our talk or our presentation today. But I emphasize and assert with, in no uncertain terms that most of the groundwater geologists that I have come across with and known, very little knowledge of surface water which is technically the way it should be, right? So you have to have a team out there. You have to have a groundwater geologist, a surface water hydrologist, and an ecologist, because typically a surface water hydrologist doesn't know too much about ecology. And ecology is important. You see how it works? It's an interdisciplinary treatment. Wells, we have wells in here, artesian wells, 
flowing artesian wells. You would recall that in that tape that um, Donna Tisdale shared with me uh, many years ago, uh, there was a lot of rain in, in Tierra del Sol and, this, and the wells, there were a bunch of wells out there, they started flowing artesial, in artesian form. They started pop, pop, the water popping out of the wells, which they didn't have it until they all got full. So when the, when the, when the uh, aquifers got full, they, they became artesian. How fascinating and interesting. They changed. Colonial depression is something that uh, has been studied. Well plants, we have studied that already. Meinzer is the great guy in terms of the well plants, 1927. I have asked you to read this paper already. We already covered this paper. Groundwater utilization, and here we cover the, uh, the issues of, um, well, this is general, recharge groundwater system discharge. So it increases, when you pump, you increase the recharge because you produce a gradient in favor of the pumping. And you decrease the recharge because the gradient has been reversed, so there's less recharge. So the pump pitch, the pump pitch, the amount of pumping comes from an increase in recharge and a decrease in discharge. And it's removed for other uses. Sometimes some of it is returned, but not all of it, because you got to use it in something, right? So we have these three scenarios that uh, we've been looking into, which is somewhere else. Groundwater, let me just say in continuing here because we've got to finish here in nine minutes. Groundwater depletion. I hold responsible, by the way, for this report. It's an easy report to read, and you should at least read it one more time before you prep for the exam. Groundwater depletion has been documented in many instances. We have the case of Borrego's, the Borrego Valley in Borrego Springs. Classical case of groundwater depletion. Water levels have declined two feet per year over the past 20 years. Now, this is data from the year 2005. I have not updated this number. It could have gone up or it could have gone down. I don't know. I know that there's some management being implemented out there. So I, 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 in my defense, I could say that this is the data that was published in the year 2006 when we wrote this report. Another example is the Ojos Negros Valley in Baja California, which we extensively studied from the year 1997 to the year 2003 three or four, 2003, I think it was, so six or seven years. What's the story here? They had a wetland and, they, and the wetland surfaced into the ground, into the, into a uh, surface from, from below into, into the area. And it showed up as two, two little lakes. And since this is in Mexico, they call it that these look like ojos negros, which means black eyes. So then they call the valley, the valley has a different name, but people started calling the valley of ojos negros and it stayed like that. To this day, we have a valley of ojos negros out there. We studied the hydrology of this valley, hydrology and everything else, for six years from 1997 to the year 2003, funded by the US government, by the way, because they were funding studies, uh, interdisciplinary studies around the border. And this, my project fit that, that that pattern. So, but in doing so, we were able to uncover this map that was put together in the year 1864. Can you see in there? It says año, year 1864, which shows the way it was in 1864. There were two, two little lakes in there, which gave their name to the valley. The land of black eyes, in the Valley of San Rafael. And they, this document was written because they were selling, they were, it, there was an exchange of ownership in 1864. I was able to uncover it from the so-called Sarate archives in Ensenada. Okay, what happened? In the year 1970, pumping started in earnest in the valley. They discovered that the soils were good. It was no rain, but there was a lot of groundwater. And, they, and by the year 1997, they had depleted it to about 40 meters, 40 meter depletion. And uh, the, the two Cienagas, Cienaga, yeah, there's a there's misspelled Cienaga in there. You know what Cienaga is. Uh, it's a little wetland. It's a Spanish word that means wetland. They disappeared. They disappeared. They were not there anymore. So 
So the valley lost the Cienegas that gave it its name. So in the year 1999, I believe, I went over there with a geologist with uh, one of the professors over at San Diego State. I said, hey, you want to spend a weekend? We go out there. I want to check something. So we went over there and hired a guy that would, uh, we located ourselves in the right place and we excavated uh, an exploration pit. And I had my geologist over there to take a look at the soils that were coming out of the pit. And sure enough, confirmed that in fact, those soils had an origin in lake, had a lake color, the lake texture and so forth. So we confirmed that in fact, the lakes were, had disappeared, but they were still there. The remnants of the lake were underground. We proved that to be the case. We proved it to ourselves. I wanted to make sure that it was correct, that I was correct. Not that I had any doubt on this map. I think the map is, is kosher, but still we wanted to say that we did it and we actually did that. Confirmed the previous existence about a hundred years ago, actually all the way to 1970. It was in 1970 that development started. Another example here, and I'm gonna finish in here, wrap it up here. I'm gonna example here on uh, Tucson, Arizona. This is an interesting, this came out of a gentleman by the name of Webb, I believe I mentioned the name uh, before. Robert Webb wrote a book. He had a bunch of old pictures. So he went out there and took new pictures and then compared them at the same site. So we have in Santa Cruz River side of Tucson, uh, on the left, 1942, and on the right, 1989. And, and the only reason why we say, well, he says that that's the same place, not exactly the same place, but very close to it. Because if you notice in here, there's a huge rock in here that has this shape, right? Can you see that? Are you guys seeing my mouse? Ryan? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, now over here is the same rock. You can't, you can't say, but there is the same rock. So the angle is not quite the same, but it shows the Santa Cruz River, which we studied, by the way. We studied the Santa Cruz River. Those of you that are taking uh, computational, I heard me talk about extensively about the Santa Cruz, yes, oh, just yesterday. And as you can see, there was a lot of riparian vegetation in 1942 and hardly any in 1989. Why? Because in the meantime, uh, Tucson developed and they pumped the heck out of their groundwater, of their aquifer. I believe it was a couple hundred feet or something like this. They, they would they abated the aquifer. I'm not sure a couple hundred feet, but that's on their order. And uh, 300 is a name that, that uh, comes to my mind. So by using all that, by, and as you can see, they, they created an ecological problem in here because the river expanded, it widened, it became more ephemeral than it was and so forth. And now, when I was there for the first time in 1985 for our study, to be honest with you, I didn't know that it was like that. I thought that the river had been there like that for a long time. And in my ignorance, because I didn't know everything at the time, certainly not, and even now, I thought it was just that the river and we're gonna model and we did model. We did model the flow with the current conditions, 1985 conditions. Only later, I was able to get a hold of Webb's book, which is a very good book, by the way. It shows not only this case, but many other cases throughout the US Southwest of before and after pictures. It's a fascinating book, which I have here in my collection. Actually, Webb gave, it, gave me a free copy when I requested it. It was good, it was nice. Tragedy of the Commons. I'm going to finish with, with the Tragedy of the Commons. And then, then it will just, the rest, it will have to remain for you to read on your own. Groundwater depletion is a logical consequence of a commons, which is a natural resource jo used jointly by many stakeholders. As with other natural resources held in common, an aquifer tends to be viewed by individuals pursuing their own self-interest as a resource to be exploited before others are able to get it. So there's a whole bunch of resources out there. There are a bunch of users. And since there's no regulation, the one that uses the most is the one that gets the, the most benefit because once the resource goes to the pit, everybody has to leave. But the one that used the most were the ones that benefit the most. So that's the rationale behind the tragedy of the commons. And, they, and since there's no control, no regulation, everybody wants to do the most damage they can in the shortest possible time. Theoretical framework is due to Hardin. It, said, it states that freedom in the commons eventually brings ruin to all, since every person is compelled to increase his or her individual benefit without limit in a world that is limited. And it comes to mind that we have an example of the tragedy of the commons in the current predicament 
of society, of Western society, the whole society, about uh, issues of global warming. Because the benefit of global warming is like a benefit to each one of us of the use of the resource, but the effect is to everybody. We have we have seen the effect, for instance, on the glaciers of South America, tropical glaciers. They're they're disappearing because of the global warming, and they're of course are not totally at fault, only a part at fault. But they're disappearing. The glaciers are disappearing anyway. So we have a section here on impacts of rainwater depletion, and I urge you to look at this graph over here. We can have dry wells, land subsidence, conal depression, saltwater intrusion next to the coast. That's interesting, fascinating. That is fascinating. I remember I, we already exceeded our time, but let me finish with this story. I was at one time out there in uh, actually Northern Peru and somebody asked me about how much uh, pumping should they do? How much pumping? And I said, well, that's easy. Just start pumping and monitor the salinity. If the salinity, which is now fresh, 300, starts increasing to five, six, seven hundred, it gets to a thousand, you know you're drawing from the, from the ocean because there's no way to get that salinity in, in flowing water that is flowing, that is flowing downstream into the ocean. So you have a, what is called induced recharge from the right side over here, and then your salinity will increase. And that is true, by the way. So finally, sustainable yield, and we come up with the concept that we should, we, ha, we are permitted by nature to use the 2% if we can zero on the figure. And I said 2% is a working number only. You should study it. You should hire the people to study it and look at it. In this case, it may be 3%, in this case, maybe 4%, but 2% is a round number in the middle. Now, just to compare, because it's important that we make some comparisons. Currently, the United States is pumping about 8 to 9% of all the aquifers, all the in, entire United States, and this number has been documented by the GS. Let's say 8%. 8% of the, uh, of the precipitation is being pumped. 8%. Now, Professor Pond says that it should be 2%. Well, who am I? Okay, just a scientist. But the point is that I believe that there is excess pumping right now of the groundwater. And I think I'm correct in that assessment um, because of everything that we know. What are we going to do about it? I don't know. In the next 30 years, the state of California is going to regulate it. But the other states have not started yet. They are hopefully we're going to kind of show the way as to how it is done. So we will see in the next 30 years. And of course, Professor Pons is not going to be here. But I'm telling you, it is coming. It will take some time, but it will come. Sustainability and water quality. In summary, we got to the end. OK, there you go, the last one. Regions of the United States where land subsidence has been linked to groundwater pumping. Land subsidence has been linked to groundwater pumping because the groundwater uh, empties the voids in the ground, and then the ground started start, start sinking. Now, take a look at this area over here. This is the area of the Central Valley of California. So is the Central Valley sinking? Yes, it is sinking. It is sinking. The last number I have is from the University of California, Davis, I believe. I quoted this figure about three or four or five years ago. I found this figure. It was an interesting figure. It said that measurements have been done in the Central Valley and showed that the depletion was three centimeters per year. The depletion of the groundwater throughout, an average, three centimeters per year. A hundred years, three meters, right? Is three meters a whole lot or a whole little? That depends, depends on the geology because it could settle. And as a matter of fact, portions of the, portions of, of the Central Valley had been subsiding at levels which are really interesting to see. There are just just Google land subsidence in the Central Valley, and you'll get all kinds of pictures out there, which I did not bother to put in here. Those are kind of not interest, not good stories to show. But this one was a global value, so I figured I could do this. And besides, this is a geological survey. You can't argue with the geological survey. These people spend their lives doing this work. If anybody's right, they must be right. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you.